said seven wedges were the number, and each, web, uh, each wedge represents a billion tons per year over 50 years. By the way, just a question for the audience here. How many wedges has the United States implemented since the year 2006? I'll, I'll take a number from somebody in the room. Please? Really cool. How many? Four. Eight, four. Eight. Identically zero. Okay. So, seven wedges to, to mitigate. Uh, and uh, now it turns out that um, uh, the wedge notion has been reanalyzed. It's continuing to be reanalyzed because when there's no public policy, there's certainly research on what we could do. So, an additional two wedges are needed because our emissions are rising. Uh, and uh, now they're talking about a total of 21 uh, wedges needed because the economy is in fact already uh, decarbonizing. Uh, and then uh, a more recent paper just published in 2013 says that 31 wedges are needed to phase out all emissions by 2060. So what's a wedge? Okay. So in 2006, the authors made very specific proposals for what a wedge represents. They are a little bit out of date now, but they are nevertheless very instructive for us to think about. So for example, cut electricity use in homes, offices, and stores by 25%. So that's uh, a, a fully realizable goal. So for example, if the escalator shut off when there's nobody on the escalator, something the Germans have done, something the Americans have never done yet. Uh, just simple ideas like that uh, are one sort of wedge. How about stop all deforestation is another wedge in this sort of agricultural and forestry. I'm sure you're all aware that deforestation is a huge problem uh, worldwide. Uh, here's increased wind power to make hydrogen for cars. Now, uh, at the time in 2006 when the authors wrote this paper, there was this notion that we were going to have a hydrogen economy. Hopefully some of you have all heard of this notion. It was very popular in, in that time, that all our vehicles would be driven uh, with hydrogen. Uh, there is still um, a community of people that believe that. You can buy it uh, for $100,000. No, $200,000, a Toyota that runs on hydrogen, a fuel cell. Uh, but the notion is that's still good work. But uh, I want to call your attention to this set of rings over here, carbon capture and storage. Install carbon capture and storage uh, at coal to send gas plants. Install at 800 coal-fired power plants around the world. So the notion, uh, even in 2006, was that at least three of these wedges could be associated with taking carbon dioxide out of the exhaust ring of a power plant sequestering it uh, safely and uh, renewably uh, underground, and that would represent uh, an opportunity. So uh, if we go back to these uh, drivers uh, and look at the uh, energy wedges uh, that, that are aimed to lower these lines, which are the uh, uh, production of CO2 from electricity, uh, and we look at their effect on consumption, and we already need more wedges because the economy is decarbonizing. Uh, and so the question is, do we really need all the objects? So in many parts of the world, not so much the United States, but in many parts of the world, the issue of climate change and consumption are now combined with spiritual uh, discussion. So you probably have read one of the most famous people in Europe is the Pope, Pope Francis, and he's re recently written a book called a Cons Excessive Consumption of Sin, which in the Catholic Church world is a bad thing. That's, uh, that's a very strong statement. Uh, and so there's quite a bit of discussion about relating excessive consumption to the spiritual values that are associated uh, with, uh, with some cultures. Uh, again, if we look at the role carbon capture could play, uh, this according to the International Energy Agency in 2012, here's emissions of CO2, gigatons of carbon in the, going into the future, and we see the role that energy efficiency could play, the role renewables could play, uh, in, including nuclear. But you see that carbon capture and sequestration represents a reasonable range uh, in this uh, uh, role of uh, mitigating the CO2 into the atmosphere. Uh, and this is, uh, represents, by the way, a temperature rise up here at 50 of about 6 degrees C. Uh, or down here, it would be about 2 degrees C. Uh, in a few, either later this, this hour or tomorrow afternoon, uh, we'll look at what the consequences to the world are for a 2 degree C or 6 degree C temperature rise. And we'll look at a globe of the Earth and see what the Earth looks like uh, in that uh, something we can look forward to. So CCS is 14%. Uh, 
so uh, many of my colleagues in the chemical sciences in particular uh, see an opportunity. Uh, rather than put CO2 into the atmosphere, why don't we take carbon dioxide and do something useful with it? Uh, So-called carbon dioxide utilization. A very popular scheme, we'll come back and revisit it shortly. So why don't we capture it and use it for commercial products? Uh, so, for example, uh, if you look in the United States, there, are, there is uh, CO2 used uh, for various things, uh, sodium carbonate, uh, urea production, calcium carbonate, of course, oil and gas is enhanced oil recovery. So we do have a market for CO2. Why not build on these markets and create new products? So rather than get our plastic bottles, the water bottles we're drinking out of, rather than make that plastic from uh, oil, uh, let's make it from CO2 that we, uh, that we get from the atmosphere. So the total uh, use of CO2 in the United States uh, represents about 100 megatons. That's the equivalent of uh, CO2 emission from three to four coal-fired power plants. Uh, enhanced oil recovery is another 65. Uh, and the uh, total emissions from uh, the United, uh, for the United States is 6,000. So you recognize that these two numbers alone are, are dwarfed by the actual emissions, which is to say we need to make a lot of products from CO2 in order to, uh, uh, to utilize it. Uh, and so we currently use less than 2%. Here's a nice uh, graphic that I think illustrates even more. The data are a little old, but nevertheless instructive. So uh, in 2009, 31,000 uh, million tons, 31 gigatons of CO2 was emitted by all the coal plants in the world, just coal, in 2009. Well, let's go to the indices for chemical products and ask, what is the top 50 chemicals produced in the world? So that includes things like sulfuric acid, and those of you who are studies, uh, students of chemistry will recognize many of these compounds. But let's just add up all 50 of them and come to the number. And that turns out to be 2,400 uh, uh, million tons uh, per year. So you see all the chemicals produced, the top 50 chemicals produced by humankind in that year is uh, a very small number uh, compared to the CO2 emitted which is to say, utilizing the CO2 emitted from a coal-fired power plant to make new products is a nonsensical notion. It's not to say there might not be opportunities, particularly an opportunity to displace uh, an industry that's using oil and emitting CO2 now with some sort of utilization scheme. But as a general scheme to deal with this, this is not practical. So, um, now let's ask the following question. Uh, let's suppose we do capture the CO2 from the coal-fired power plants. Maybe it, it comes to your mind, how much space do we need to store this? Um, because these volumes are enormous. So let's do a quick calculation. Uh, here's the amount of CO2 emitted from a typical 500 megawatt power plant. I'm going to store it in a disk that's 10 meters thick and supercritical CO2. Uh, and let's say, for example, that uh, the Earth actually occupies 80%. And so we can only access 20% of that disk, so sand, imagine packed sand. Um, and uh, there's the density and a plant lifetime. And so I, what I've shown here uh, is a map, hopefully it's not as clear as I'd hoped, but it's a map of Punjab. And here's Amritsar here, this sort of jagged. And this square here represents just the CO2 from one 500 megawatt coal-fired power plant. And, and this uh, greater disk here represents uh, what would be needed if we didn't separate the CO2 from the exhaust gas and used all the gases from the combustion process. So you can see uh, this argument alone tells us that we have, if we're going to store CO2 from a coal-fired power plant, we do have to separate the CO2 from the other gases. Otherwise, the aerial and volume requirements uh, grow uh, uh, unreasonably. This is 5 kilometers. This is about 25 kilometers in radius. Yeah. So what percentage do you take for this, like CO2 in the Both. Well, that's, well, that's, 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 that's right. Good question. Um, so uh, let's take a look now at, uh, rather than look at wedges, let's look at the sort of circle uh, of uh, attributes that are going. We have climate change going on. We have impacts. Uh, we all have a desire uh, for an improved well-being. And we consume goods and services. We consume energy. Uh, we introduce CO2 that goes into the atmosphere, and then that changes the climate. So this is the cycle that we're sort of stuck in right now. And if you look at these blue uh, words here, they represent opportunities for us to insert ourselves into the circle to try and mitigate uh, the climate change associated with CO2 in the atmosphere, including conservation, efficiency, uh, 
uh, low energy emissions, and then carbon capture, and then of course this notion of, of uh, geoengineering, which we'll come to uh, later on in the course. So CO2 removal uh, is really uh, where I want to be for the remainder of this time. So uh, again, we're back to where we were. I just wanted to point out these, uh, we're not going to run out of fossil fuels, it's huge. And carbon capture and sequestration is really necessary to reduce uh, emissions from the existing infrastructure. So in the hour and a half we've had together so far, a little less than that, what I've tried to do is lay out for you the scale of energy consumption and CO2 production. Uh, I've tried to make it clear to you that um, uh, ending that, that production of CO2 instantaneously and switching to renewables is not feasible, it's not economically possible, and therefore we're left with strategies uh, that mitigate the CO2 in the atmosphere, one of which uh, is carbon capture and sequestration. So uh, when you have a discussion with your colleagues about how to view this issue, uh, there are four worldviews, according to our colleagues in Princeton who talked about the wedges. And the question you would ask yourself and your friends, first of all, are fossil fuels hard to displace? The answer is yes or no. And is climate change an urgent matter? So I would argue that fossil fuels are hard to displace, and I would say it's an urgent matter, so I would be over here. So, the, so these four views uh, means that I really need to encourage current carbon capture, it needs to be here, and to make three degrees C, let alone two or one and a half is a tough job. Uh, and if they're not hard to displace and it's not an urgent matter, then whatever you decide to do, like nuclear power or renewables, they're really not motivated by climate change. And I should probably tell you that there is a community of people, certainly in the United States, maybe in India as well, uh, who are not motivated by climate change at all. Uh, they look at energy consumption and production as a business opportunity, and they see renewables and nuclear power as a business opportunity to make money. So they're in this space right here. Uh, and, uh, and so you may find yourself uh, in one of these uh, areas over here. So our goal for the next uh, few minutes together is to look at CO2 and ask, is it a greenhouse gas and how does it affect temperature? Uh, we'll find that there's overwhelming evidence that it is so. Uh, are we responsible? Uh, and what do models say about uh, the predictions in the future? So uh, we'll I'll start this now and we'll uh, finish this uh, at 2 o'clock tomorrow. So what do we know about the atmosphere and how is it changing? So uh, I call your attention to this lovely island uh, in the Pacific Ocean, uh, the island of Hawaii, on top of the Mauna Loa Observatory. is a station there where uh, we measure uh, CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, it's called a Keeling curve, for, uh, I'll say a why for a minute. This represents parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere, and this represents the year. These measurements began in the mid-1950s and have been ongoing ever since. I'll come back and tell you what the, the squiggles mean. The wiggles, okay? Let's just take the average for a moment. It's clearly going up. Our atmosphere is changing. Uh, measurements uh, are made all over the world, uh, and they're uh, honored by this man, Charles uh, Keeling, uh, and uh, he's associated with this Keeling curve. He's recently uh, deceased. So uh, all throughout the world now, there are stations reporting uh, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. The one in Hawaii has been sort of the benchmark because it's been in existence for so long. It's also well above the, um, uh, it's very high up on the top of this mountain, and so most of the weather that passes uh, goes underneath it, so it's a very stable platform. There are measurements in the southern hemisphere and the northern hemisphere throughout the world. Uh, and uh, in January, this was 402 parts per million, uh, and as you probably know, everywhere in the world now, it's above 400 parts per million which represents a significant increase. Uh, so here's the uh, global, world's global temperature. Here's a function of the concentration. Uh, here's a year. And uh, we recognize right away that there seems to be a correlation between the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, as shown here, and uh, the global mean temperature, as, as shown by these bars. So is this a correlation or causation? This is a critical component of our discussion about climate change. Because if they're not causal, then our concern about CO2 is misplaced. So that's something we really uh, need to address. So the hypothesis is that uh, increased CO2 leads to global warming. So the question is, are they increasing? The answer is yes. Those measurements are very clear. And the question is, what's the mechanism by which that would change uh, the climate? 
and, uh, and in fact, can we measure it? So we're going to try to address this question now, and we'll come to this question uh, in a few minutes. So who was it who first started talking about CO2 in the atmosphere? Students of chemistry will recognize this man's name, Arrhenius. Uh, he's forever associated with how chemical kinetics occur. Uh, but interestingly enough, at that time, uh, which is in uh, just about the turn of the 20th century, he published a paper in which if we, he said if we doubled the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, he expected the temperature of the world to go up by 5 degrees C. Uh, he made a, a refinement to that calculation uh, and came up with the number 2.1 degrees C. It's really quite amazing. Uh, we're going to come back and look at a graph in a few minutes that shows uh, what is the effect of doubling of CO2 with our best possible models. And the answer is it turns out to be about the same number, although the reasons are very, very different. Uh, so how do, we, how do we imagine what CO2 does in the atmosphere? And the way we have to start is we have to do an energy balance on the Earth. Uh, and these are calculations that are straightforward in, in concept and tedious to do properly. But we want to calculate what is the temperature of the world uh, with and without CO2 in the atmosphere, or with and without an atmosphere forever. So we have sun, which is uh, radiating. It's a black body at a few thousand degrees Kelvin. And we have the earth, which itself is radiating as a black body at a few hundred degrees Kelvin. So we need to do an energy balance in this process to predict what the average temperature of the earth. Because, of course, we are in equilibrium. That is to say, uh, there's no transience in the temperature, uh, at least on a sort of geophysical time scales. So uh, black body radiation is what is associated with this. And we know the physics behind black body radiation, the flux of energy, uh, uh, energy per area per time is a constant times the temperature of the fourth power. So now we have uh, the energy from the sun uh, impinges upon the earth, and the earth receives a fraction of it in proportion, in radial proportion. Uh, and so that's why we have the radii there. And um, let's see, the energy from out from the earth represents the earth radiating with its area uh, and its t to the four. So we have two different temperatures, the sun and the earth. Uh, and we just uh, e uh, equalize these two. That is the energy coming in from the sun uh, equals the energy out from the earth. That's uh, conservation of energy. And you can do the calculation. It takes a few uh, steps and you get a number. Uh, you get some data and the number is six degrees C. So uh, that's just assuming that the Earth is a, is a bowl and the Sun is a black body. And that number is, uh, is off by about, uh, about 10 degrees C. So we ignored a few things, so let's go back and consider them. So we ignored the fact that clouds reflect the Sun differently than land and differently than sand, the so-called albedo coefficient. That's really uh, how much light is reflected when sunlight impinges on it. It varies a lot, and so we need to take that into account and we recognize that about 30% of the sun's energy turns out to be reflected. And so um, we can uh, take that into a calculation and we, uh, we do the energy balance. Let's do that a calculation again. And now we have the albedo factored in there and we get minus 18 degrees C. So um, this simple energy balance alone uh, tells us uh, that uh, we're close, but not quite from what the actual temperature is. And of course, the difference between this temperature and this temperature is the role of the atmosphere and the so-called greenhouse effect, uh, which is what stabilizes our planet. So let's take a look at some more detail uh, at what a physicist has to do in order to calculate what the temperature, the black body temperature of the Earth is going to be. So we have incoming solar radiation uh, in units. It doesn't really matter, watts per square meter. And then some of that is reflected. Some of that is absorbed by the atmosphere. Some of it is ma makes it to the Earth. The Earth itself is a black body, and it's radiating up this much energy, some of which goes outside, but some of which is reflected back from the gases uh, that represent the atmosphere. So these would absorb emitted radiation and radiate it back and change the temperature of the Earth. And so if we just look at these numbers, they represent the conservation of energy. There's uh, 340 in, reflected 100, 240 coming out, so that's good. Uh, but this approximate sign is critical because we recognize that small differences in these numbers represent what's called the radiative forcing. And a way to think about this is to say that um, uh, changes in the radiation up and reflected back 
force the black body temperature of the Earth to change. So if we introduce greenhouse gases and more of this energy is reflected back, then the black body temperature of the Earth has to go up so that the total emitted energy remains the same. And so this uh, represents a short picture of uh, what the greenhouse uh, effect looks like, and it tells us why it is our planet has been so stable. The number one greenhouse gas turns out to be water. Go back and talk about that. So let's uh, look uh, now at, at what would be interesting to measure. So let's take some satellites and we'll put them to measure the incoming radiation, the reflected, and the outgoing radiation of the Earth. Uh, we'll use satellites, which are mainly infrared cameras. Uh, and ground instruments we'll use to measure how much light uh, lands here on the planet at a particular place, and of course how much is radiated up. The difference between all these numbers is the radiative forcing. So this is now a measured number, right? So now what are we going to do? We're going to compare this measured number to the changes in the greenhouse gases that occur on the planet Earth over a decade. And compare them and see what's up. Amazingly enough, this was just published in 2015. The first, I would say, sort of definitive, concrete, quantitative measurement of the greenhouse effect of CO2 on the planet. Here's the radiative forcing that I just mentioned, calculated from those instruments. Here's the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. And you see the radiative force not only follows this oscillatory trend, which we'll come back and figure out in a minute, but it gets the average trend in temperature correct. So um, CO2 is a greenhouse gas. It's changing the temperature of the planet in exactly and quantitatively the ways physics says it should. No models needed, only data. So it's our CO2 is warming the planet, uh, and it's doing it by radiative forcing. And uh, the role of humans uh, in this is sort of uh, uh, established. Sorry, Baron, how does that you? OK, so let's uh, ask ourselves, uh, what are the other? What is the composition of the Earth's atmosphere, uh, and what role does this affect? So these are the volumes in ppm, these are the volume percents. And you recognize that carbon dioxide is uh, only 400 parts per million, but it represents this sort of key player. It's difficult for some students to come to terms with the fact that such a small number, 400 ppm, has such a dramatic effect. Uh, but uh, it does. It's been measured. And the interesting thing that we should ask, and we'll come look at a few slides later on, what are the consequences for even these small changes in, in CO2 in the atmosphere? So this radiative forcing, remember changes in the greenhouse gases uh, change the radiation reflected back to the planet and force the black body temperature to a higher number. Or a lower number, as you see what happens with aerosols. Aerosols in the atmosphere actually reflect more sunlight to change the albedo, and they are a negative radiative forcing. Here's CO2 and methane. Uh, other greenhouse gases, uh, and what you see is the total net human activities uh, exhibit strong radiative forcing uh, towards, a, uh, in, a, in a positive sense, which is to say we've increased greenhouse gases. Measurement of these quantities in both time and space is a significant challenge for those of you that are scientists. It represents an extraordinary opportunity to be both intellectually engaged as well as working on behalf of the planet. So CO2 in the atmosphere absorbs the outgoing radiation, causes the forcing, and the Earth uh, must heat up to counter this forcing and maintain. So which uh, one is uh, worse? So um, uh, these are all attributes uh, of what makes a greenhouse gas worse, and in particular what its lifetime is. So uh, this is an interesting thing about methane, because many of you have heard that methane is a significant problem in terms of climate change. It is a significant problem. This is particularly true in the United States and other parts of the world where natural gas is being used to replace coal for energy production. So natural gas uh, is uh, fracked. Uh, hydraulic fracturing is uh, a mechanism to produce a lot more uh, natural gas. And as a result, a lot of methane is seeping into the atmosphere. Methane also has several natural sources. So for example, the flatulence from cattle and as the Western world in particular develops an appetite for meat, we want more cattle, the cattle um, uh, part, and, uh, and, and introduce a lot of a lot of methane. It turns out it comes from cattle flatulence. 
but interesting, the lifetime of methane is only about 10 years in the atmosphere. Um, can anybody guess? You know, it's presumptuous of me, but I'll just ask. What is the final product when methane decomposes in the atmosphere? What does it decompose to? Anybody know? Oh, you. Yeah. So, so the end result is that methane is not only a strong greenhouse gas itself, its, it's short lifetime is hardly anything to be happy about because it just decomposes into carbon dioxide. Uh, water is, in fact, the worst greenhouse gas. Uh, it has a very strong, so why aren't we worried about water in the atmosphere? And in fact, why don't you just say, well, Professor Reimer, rather than worry about CO2, why don't we just take some water out of the atmosphere? Um, well, it turns out we don't really control the amount of water in the atmosphere. Um, mankind has a, a very little effect on, on that. Uh, and it turns out the amount of water in the atmosphere has not changed much in at least three and a half billion years. And as evidenced by analysis of, uh, in, of geological samples. Uh, it also turns out water is a positive feedback on whatever does happen. So as the planet gets warmer, more water evaporates and we have a larger greenhouse effect. Uh, and as, of course, it gets colder, the opposite is true. So uh, what happens with carbon dioxide uh, is that as we, or methane, as we increase it in the atmosphere and the greenhouse effect increases, actually water is an accelerator uh, of the greenhouse effect. So we are worried about water, but we're worried about the consequences of it because of, uh, of the result of CO2. So are CO2 levels increasing? Yes. By what's the mechanism? Uh, well, it's uh, uh, radiative forcing. And can it be measured? And the answer is yes. So uh, let's talk about some of the consequences of that, of what happens when we have a greenhouse uh, gas effect and the black body temperature of the planet is increasing. So the question then becomes, well, what's the weather like in Amritsar? And is there any connection between today's foggy day uh, and climate change? And that is a vexing problem because uh, according to this famous humorist, the climate is what we expect and weather is what we get. In fact, climate, that word climate means a statistical analysis of the long-term averages of things that you experience daily. So weather is today's events. Uh, and we talk about the probability of it being foggy, and climate is the long-term measure. So uh, if we look at uh, land and ocean temperatures and how they compare with uh, the average since 1880, and this was data taken from uh, July 2015, the uh, Nas National Oceanographic uh, Association of the USA uh, has a very nice website, noaa.gov. You should check it out sometime when you're bored. Uh, they have all these really wonderful graphs. Uh, and here you see record warmth in various parts of the world. Uh, some places, to be sure, that are cooler than average, but I think your eyeball can easily detect uh, that the planet is warming, uh, and as evidenced by the pink colors. If you look at the United States and ask what about uh, weather events for 2015, uh, there are an extraordinary number of weather events that are unusual and anomalous. And you might ask yourself, is there a connection between climate change and these? And of course, that's where we want to go. Uh, let's look at the top 10 warmest years. Uh, and you recognize that since 1998, the 10 of the hottest uh, years are all uh, in, in given recently. And we are on track. We will know soon. But it, we, it is believed that 2016 will be, in fact, the warmest year ever on record. Uh, so. Uh, the global average of combined temperatures are definitely increasing. Uh, and here are some uh, news clips that just uh, reinforce that notion. So uh, one way uh, to graph that is to look at the data that comes from a whole variety of sources. This is time from the year 1000 uh, to more or less the present day. And here's uh, the northern uh, hemisphere temperatures for which there are the most data. The gray here represents all the different uh, kinds of individual measurements. And the blue and the uh, black represent reconstructions with different degrees of smoothing. Uh, and you can see uh, that something interesting is happening recently. Uh, and this recent trend is quite unusual. Uh, this is, for me, the most powerful visual graphic. So please watch it for a moment. It represents temperature as a function of time. Uh, and it's um, uh, as you go from uh, around the clock, the calendar, from December around. So I'm going to run that one again for you, so you, uh, so you get the, uh, the full impact. So again, these are the temperatures reported at different 
times a year on the radio block. You see there was a couple of cold years there.